Hey everybody, welcome to the Base Shed Podcast. My name's Ryan Roberts. How you doing, folks? Uh, my name is Ryan. I would like to welcome all the new listeners. Thanks for checking out the podcast. You can also uh, find information at facebook.com backslash the base shed, Twitter at base shed, Instagram at the base shed. Uh, there's a YouTube channel. There's links to all of it at the base shed.com. And you can email me at Ryan at the base shed.com as well. Um, you can sign up for the newsletter. That, that goes out uh, probably a couple times a month, right? Letting letting everybody know what's going on with the content on the website as far as upcoming guests um, on, on the podcast. And um, you can sign up for the newsletter by texting the word SHED, S-H-E-D, to 66866. Once again, that is the word SHED, S-H-E-D, to 66866. All right, let's do this. So today on the show is my friend John Story. John Story is a guitar player, singer, composer, band leader, and arranger. Um, If you listen to the podcast regularly, you know that I have a problem with last names, right? Those that's well documented. Uh, I'm just always I feel like Dick Van Dyke. I'm just always tripping over the ottoman of a last name, right? I come 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 in, come in. I'm on a mic. I'm talking here, and boom, hit the ottoman. I can't read a last name. I'm on the ground. Everybody's laughing. That's right. I'm a clown. <laughs> Seems like there was a lot of angst in that. I don't know. I, I've done a couple takes of this already. I'm trying to like set up who John is and introduce you to John. And now I'm just all the way down a rabbit hole talking about myself tripping on the floor. I promised myself I was leaving this one in, though. So whatever happens, happens. Right? This is it. This is the last time this happens. All right. We're going back to John's story. So, he does he does all that. <laughs> He's a guitar player, singer, composer, band leader, and arranger. He performs with the world-renowned Mildred Snitzer Orchestra with actor-pianist Jeff Goldblum. Um, that orchestra has a debut album out on Deco Records, and it is titled Capital Studio Sessions. That record tops number 16 on the Billboard Emerging Artist Charts, number 1 on the Billboard Jazz Charts, and was voted Best New Artist by Jazz Times in 2018. John is also a founding member of the New West Guitar Group. Him and I are going to discuss that quite a bit. Um, He's currently touring with vocalist Steve Tyrell, Sarah McKenzie, Too Marvelous for Words, the music of Nat King Cole, and singer-songwriter Spencer Day. Now, it was really exciting to have John on the podcast because he just released his debut solo recording titled Ponderosa. Uh, That record is a duo with pianist Josh Nelson, who's absolutely brilliant, as well as John. John's also brilliant. Everybody's equally brilliant. I'm not giving more praise to Josh, but Josh is brilliant, and so is John, right? Everybody's brilliant. You're brilliant. I don't know. I can't get the last names together, so I'm really not going to throw myself in that category. Not not so much with the brilliance over here. Everybody else, you're good. You're brilliant. Uh, this record, Ponderosa, um, when I was listening to it, I was really into it because he covers he covers like quite a bit of ground in the record um, and does some things that 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 I don't. When I think of John and have played with him, we're always we're always just playing jazz and it's super swinging and he sounds amazing. Uh, there's some things on here that are kind of nods to James Taylor and this folky thing, and we talk about his process of putting that together and where those early influences come from. Uh, I will have links up at thebaseshed.com backslash podcast backslash John Story um, with links to his record, so everybody can check that out. And um, I think I've gone on enough tangents here already, so it's probably time that we just uh, listen to John not go on tangents because he's actually very well spoken I, w- I remember that while we were while we were having the interview uh i was thinking to myself like man this guy's got it together like he's really well spoken and i was envious of that um so here's my talk with john so yeah man cool let's uh let's dig in you're from the Killer. northwest yeah i where are you from again ryan i'm from phoenix you're from phoenix 
Okay. Yeah. Slick. Oh, my yeah, no. Got my yeah. Arizona shirt on today. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm from uh, Central Oregon. Here, let me do this and just make sure I don't get any whistles or bells or anything. Here. There we go. Um, yeah, I'm from Central Oregon, and my whole family's from Eastern Oregon. They were all wheat farmers out there in Pendleton. Okay. And then... Um, so did you grow up on a farm situation? I didn't, but but I was out there all the time. My my grandparents had 2,500 acres of wheat property. Wow. And so I, my cousins, we would be out there a lot, and I, you know, did a lot of fun outdoorsy stuff out there. I'm a big fisherman and all that. You yeah. Know? And... Um, then, um, yeah, and then my parents divorced when I was going into high school. My mom and I moved to Portland, and then okay. that was when I got really serious about my music, and uh-huh. I was around excellent mentors up there who were fantastic jazz musicians who gave me opportunities to sit in on their gigs. Now, was the getting serious about playing around that time due to your age? Had you already been playing, or was this kind of a cathartic thing to process the, the new family dynamic shift? It was both of that for sure. I was I was practicing to escape a lot of that, sure. and then I was I was practicing because I felt like I had traction in that area of my life, and right. I was making progress. And people around me were, were really encouraging, and it was um, it was helping me meet new people. Mm-hmm. And it was ex- and it was actually at one point it was it was a sad time in my life, and at another point it was a really exciting time. And so right. it was very lucky. I just was able to really focus and I went to jazz camp and all the stuff, you know, up there and, and met kind of met friends who were all over the place up there Okay. versus growing up in Bend was pretty isolated. You know, you're yeah. was, at the time Bend was a pretty small town and now it's over a hundred thousand people. So it's a lot bigger now, but what was the live music scene like country music and just, okay. you know, resort. It, it's a resort community. Yeah. So there's a lot of cover bands. There wasn't really, anything going on there but i had a great classical guitar teacher mentor okay there and i studied with him from when i was about five and a half years old oh, until wow. i was 13 and okay. so i played classical guitar for eight years yeah and he introduced me to antonio carlos Chobim and a couple other jazz musicians because he was a fan of jazz but he didn't really play a lot of jazz he was a classically trained musician okay you know and then when i got the seat in my j- jazz band in middle school on guitar Fortunately, my mom being a music teacher, she was like, well, here's George Benson, here's Jim Hall, here's this. Okay. And she had a couple friends who were jazz musicians, one in particular, this great trombone player from New York, John Allred, okay. um, burning trombone player. Nice. Um, and he sent me back there all the way out to Oregon from New York. He sent me a whole box of CDs and said, here's Wes Montgomery. And he pl- and he played, yeah. he was active at this time. Here's Pat Metheny, here's John Schofield. And it was like, this guy sent me this little box, which changed my whole life. It, right. was, oh, it really was like the keys to this thing. Because, okay. you know, here I am in Bend. There's no way I would have been exposed to that music there. Sure. None of the s- CD stores had any jazz except Kenny G and John Tesh. So it was okay. like, I would never have, <laughs> I would have never have, encountered it and and then i i got i got the sound in my ear and then my teacher chris at the time said hey you know this is so great you're doing jazz and but i won't be able to really teach you that i loved but he gave me more recordings okay and that was when i networked with the guitar teacher who was over the mountain at university of oregon mike denny and i was my mom was able to scrounge together some money and she would take me over there once every couple months to have a lesson with him okay and he was the teacher i had who said okay Grant Green and Kenny Burrell, yeah. and these guys are jazz guitar players, and these guys are not jazz guitar players. You know, <laughs> he was kind of a, uh, he's kind of a funny guy like that, and and it was actually a really was he was, he, was this in terms of like <laughs> his response to the Schofield and the Matheny? Yeah. like he's just it going was. tradition totally. And okay. he one of these guys that played a really old school arch top guitar through a tiny old tube amp, you know, yeah, f- kind of like the pre hipster hipster kind of dude. Yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> and it was actually funny enough. It was actually a great thing for me when I was that age because I was like okay so this is jazz guitar and this isn't jazz right, guitar right. and then of course I drank that Kool-Aid and <laughs> and got myself an old arch top and and just tried to sound like Grant Green sure. and I told all my, my friends to be like oh do you play new rock I was like I don't play Nirvana that stuff's not jazz you know yeah, yeah, right. and and in a funny way that that direct laser beam intensity focus really spawned um what I still do today, which sure. is just, I mean, I'm always trying to work on my bebop playing. And even though stylistically with my new album and with other stuff I've done over the years, I've gone back to the folksier stuff that I did. You know? Yeah, I would definitely want to talk about your record. But when I was yeah. listening to it, I think it took me 
Um, you you can I know you'll be able to tell me whatever song, whatever track number Tinseltown is. Yeah. Uh huh. By the time I got to Tinseltown, I'm like, okay, that's John's story. Uh huh. Like that's that's where I think of you. Right. You know, from having played straight with ahead you. jazz. Yeah. But yeah. Super swinging. Um, but it was gr- so great to hear the other stuff. Yeah. And not be introduced to the record. With that super swinging thing. Right. Well, uh, yes. Well, I have a lot of great things to talk about the record. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah. So you're studying with this guy. Yeah, right? I studied with Mike and then did jazz camp. And then I met some younger kids my age, a couple drummers and bass players who were mm-hmm. up in Portland. And my mom and I, again, with my parents' marriage failing, and then my mom saying, hey, maybe we should make a move to Portland okay, so that you'll be in better music programs and you can study with some guys. And I was And are you an only child? Yeah. Okay. And I was ecstatic. My dad had actually had a massive stroke and was in an assisted living home by this time. And oh, he wow. was back in Pendleton. And so Is my, that East or Central? That's Eastern Oregon. Okay. Yeah. And so he's and he's still there and he's still in the nursing home today. And so I was going out there to visit him and at the time my grandparents were still alive and, and my family was really fractured after all this, but my mom being a musician, mm-hmm. you know, she and I just uh, our lives got it was such an it was such an interesting time because the 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 amount of music that I was delving into at that point was just crazy versus before with my dad I'd spend a lot of time with him fishing yeah you know and I mean <laughs> we would just you know we did a lot of outdoorsy kind of stuff together and he was not a musician okay um, but and, during this period in the family yeah was your mom really latching onto music too yeah to kind she, of as a an escape I think so and she with her music teaching she went back to teach she, she hadn't been teaching music for, for 20 years okay and then after my dad's stroke she went back to teaching music she's a classically trained pianist and okay. she's done USO she did USO tours in the 70s and, and you know did a bunch of worked at Disney as an entertainer okay. so she had a lot of history with that and, yeah. and that the music gene comes from that corner sure. of my family the entertainment kind of thing right and she you know she did everything she could to get me all these opportunities and when it came time for me to go apply in music schools of course I looked at New York and Boston mm-hmm. and LA and she didn't have a lot of money to get me to these auditions and my teacher Chris Wilson who I'd hadn't been um, had pitched in and helped financially to get me to some of these That's auditions. Amazing. Yeah, and and some other people helped me along the way a little bit and paid for some plane tickets. And I got into MSM and New England Conservatory and USC. And you know, at the time, I you know, it's funny with this student loan crisis we have in the United States. It's it, it, I didn't I was just so unaware at that time of like how much money it would really take me to go yeah. leap from there. To me, it was like, well, the music will just get me there. You know, I'm just, my, my playing will get me to Boston or New York, and then that'll get me gigs, and then yeah. I'll be fine. Yeah, I'll be amazing. I, I was yeah. 17, and I didn't, th- I didn't know anything about sure. anything with of that. Course which is amazing. And, and my mom was like, well, you know, let's see how this all turns out. USC ended up giving me the most scholarship money. And okay. I also thought at the time I was like, well, probably would be not the worst thing on the world for me to be on the West coast, be closer to my parents. Mm-hmm. Um, and LA's not, you know, LA's a couple hour flight from Oregon and, and I, right. and I'm, and then, you know, USC just, it felt right to me to go to a guitar program and, right. But New York was my first choice. I really wanted to go to New York. Which, uh, what did you have your sights on? Like what school, Manhattan what teacher? Manhattan School of Music with Jack Wilkins. And okay. at the time I didn't, you know, Juilliard wasn't offering a jazz program yet. This was just before 9-11, you know, and um, I didn't know about the new school. I didn't sure. know about, I just, I just heard about MSM. One of my f- friends from high school was a little older than me. He was a classically trained trumpet player and went and went got it went to new england conservatory and he okay. told me all about those schools on the east coast and um i really looked up to him because he was the first musician i met close to my age who had kind of an uncompromising level yeah, of attention yeah, yeah. to his musicianship and practiced all the time and was really ahead of of you know beyond even all state and all these honor band things he was just like you know i'm setting my sights on getting a symphonic gig and and What's he did he doing that. Now, dude? Yeah, he did that. He's in Israel now, principal okay. trumpet of the Israeli Philharmonic, and he's cool. co-principal of the Boston Civic Orchestra. So had a really great career as a trumpeter. That's awesome. So anyway, but yeah, yeah. that that was got me kind of th- thinking about the East Coast, and it's funny looking back at that. How just I was like, yeah, I'm just gonna. I'm going to make it work yeah, somehow. Yeah. I've got nothing to lose. I think that's another it was another theme of my life at that time. Sure. Cuz we my mom we we had to start all over. We had lost our house and had lost a lot of stuff and um I just was like, you know what? 
I got nothing to lose. I might as well right. move to L.A. or New York. Yeah. See what happens. So you, you, know? <laughs> so you came out here. What year is that to go to USC? To that fall of 02. Okay. And then so th- another thing about my record, too, is like this signifies 17 years of me being in Los Angeles. Okay. And starting August, at the end of August here when I have my release show, um, it flips over to 18 years I've been in L.A. And yeah. I lived in Oregon for 18 years. So okay, I've really 50, been in 50 been in california now yeah. over half my life and sure. for the longest time i felt more like an oregonian and and, okay. and i still do and i i miss it but i've it, it, this album was kind of a way for me to say goodbye a little bit to that time in my life and, okay. and feel like i've moved on from oregon a little bit yeah, yeah, yeah. more and because just time just time does that yeah 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 you know and, right. and so it's it's fascinating it seems like just yesterday i started usc started the program there but it's um, yeah, it's seventeen years ago, <laughs> and that's crazy, right? Like I think I've been in L.A. July, so uh-huh. yeah, July uh, will be thirteen years. Wow, thirteen, yeah, oh six, yeah, thirteen, and it's just like really, that's thirteen years. Like yeah. it just flies by, and I don't know if that's some just like growing up situation or if yeah. there's, there's some weird time warp in LA. I do believe there's a time warp here. <laughs> well, the, you know, as I mentioned, one of the lyrics is at the end of California is that the seasons stay the same. And it's <laughs> right, like right. the first decade goes by so quick. Cause you don't, you know, I grew up where there's a lot of ice and snow and the winters are long up there. You know, yeah. you go from November to April, there's ice and snow and it's, okay. it's shitty. And then you, you're down here and you don't encounter that. And you're like, Whoa, a year just went by. Yeah. You know, sometimes you might need a hoodie other than that. That's it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah I mean, crazy. I haven't worn a windbreaker, and I haven't heard the word sleet on the weather report in <laughs> yeah, 10 never, years. Ever, ever, sleet right. and black ice. Those are two things you don't hear about down here, you know? So, sleet. Yeah. So, I, I, I'm i just, yeah, and, and it, it does fly, and I think it's also a sign that my career here has taken a lot of turns, and I can think back to each year after USC and really remember what I was doing okay. each year, each time. It's kind of broken into these these phases almost of, so what are those you get you get done you yeah. um did you ever go for a master's or did you say a bachelor's well you know i always had an idea that i would get an advanced degree being that my mom is a music educator and you know i i didn't know if i could support myself entirely with with my music um and i had seen the model a lot of people had done where they had gotten the advanced degree mm-hmm. and taught at the college level or whatever and but I also figured that I needed to get out of college for a couple of years and really test myself and see w- sure. what kind of money can I, can I do this? How, where does the work come from? It's a different learning environment for yeah, sure. And I, so I moved to Long Beach to get out of downtown LA and to really kind of change my perception of mm-hmm. all of Southern California and put myself closer to Orange County. I was gigging more in Orange County at that time. Yeah. And casual gigs, and okay. I got a I got a music job in Irvine at Jim's Music, teaching after school guitar like three four days a week. Okay, which was supporting me, but but yeah, I, I at that point I was like, okay, I know I want to get a graduate degree, but I don't want to do it yet. Yeah, yeah, and I took four years off, which was a great sure great amount of time, four or five years, and um, the, you know, I really considered going back to USC. Because I love USC and I, I love all my professors there, but I also felt that I needed to artistically branch out more, and I okay. needed to have a graduate program that maybe wasn't as academic. Okay, because USC is a highly academic place, and of course, Cal Arts, um, you know, is the place to go if you want a non-academic sure. right. degree program. And Larry Kuntz and I had become really close at that time, and I talked to him about it, and he was del- he was interested and delighted that I would want to come up there and nice. do the teaching fellowship with him, where I would teach some students and okay. and do that. And so yeah, and I entered Cal Arts 2010 and graduated with the MFA in 2012. Okay, and then at that point, I told myself, okay. If I can, so now you're at you're at the yeah. ten year mark of having yes. been here, and you got, right. and it seems like you went through a healthy course, like you knocked out the, the bachelor's, took a healthy break, yep, you know, got some real world, uh, you know, you're being a musician in Los yep. Angeles. Now yep. it's like okay, go back in. So now are you going from Long Beach because. Kellerts is what? What's uh, <laughs> up in Valencia? Valencia, that's part yeah. Of I had moved several times actually. I went from Long Beach, and then in two, th- 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 so that's two thousand six to seven, summer of 07, I put all my stuff in storage. 
rented an apartment in Berlin for about a month and okay. hung out with my buddies with New West. And t- we toured around Europe kind of illegally without a visa. <laughs> Came back and booked another six weeks of gigs around the United States. So all summer I was just a vagabond playing gigs. Okay. Then I found my buddies in Echo Park who needed a roommate, and I was there until January 2009. And those Is were this the re- like a musician house? Yeah, and okay. it was the recession years, and this was back when I was... The rent in that house in Echo Park in 2007 was $420 a month. <laughs> and Damn. the house had a slanted floor and was full of cockroaches and had possums that ran around the attic all night long like possum roller derby up there. And, <laughs> And the place was was a bit of poverty with a view. Yeah. <laughs> and Echo Park was not Echo Park like it is now. Sure. Uh, there were a lot of Korean gangsters and all sorts of stuff there. So I was there through the recession and had many months where my bank account would go to about $60. And it was rough. And then things started turning a little bit. In 2009, I, I found an apartment... Um, down in the beach in Playa del Rey, and I moved down there and had a crazy roommate situation. This older man who was a government contractor who was the most odd eccentric person you could imagine. Okay. But also an excellent roommate because with his job, he was gone for weeks and weeks and weeks Perfect. and weeks. So I had this place that was 150 yards off high tide all to myself most of the time. Yeah. So those were the party years. I was 25, and I would have crazy, crazy parties down there. Yeah. And I practiced a lot in my teaching shifted more t- t- I got better teaching jobs I was teaching classroom okay I taught fourth and fifth grade at one place and sixth through eighth at another and so I got my classroom these jobs after school programs or they were actually during the school day and it was through um education through music Los Angeles okay and I was teaching in an LAUSD school and at a parochial school now what's that like don't you have to have teacher credential to do that not for teaching artistship programs you know okay. although those jobs have gotten more and more competitive in recent years back then they were really looking they were like we want to have musicians who are in the community go into the classroom and sure. do this teaching and they basically provided music teachers to schools that were underserved by music and okay. the nonprofit provided half the funding and then donors and the school and everyone else provided the other half Got through it. fundraising and and whatnot yeah and I did that and it was great. I got a really good, really hard job. That's the hardest gig I've ever done, for sure. That te- the classroom? Yeah, hardest thing I've ever done in my career. But it Because of what, actually? Because of the... The administration, a- okay, the, the, the paperwork, the, red tape the kids, part? everything. Um, okay. Working with middle schoolers, um, you know, and um, being a... You feel like you have to be a bit of a politician, like you're, you're basically fighting for the music, and a lot of people are telling you how to do your job. Mm-hmm. So, and there's a lot of miscellaneous obligations besides just teaching in the classroom, like all sorts of professional development and all sorts of meetings and right. Christmas concerts and spring concerts. And so it was hard, but I'm glad I did it. And I got into the groove with that. And it was great to wake up and go teach from 8 a.m. to noon and go make a couple hundred bucks before of most of my musician friends were, were up. And they also, at the time, were very flexible with my touring because my touring was pretty much exclusively with New West. But we And what year did that start? Two out with with um with new west no new west oh yeah, yeah 2005 okay so by this point so you're you're going to usc mm-hmm. at this point and mm-hmm. explain what new west guitar at that yeah. point was quartet sure. was and is now yeah so new west guitar group nowadays okay. we call it uh, was was originally called the new west guitar quartet and it officially started in the spring of 2004 but our first tour was the summer of 2005 when we, we went to Japan for a week and represented USC at the World's Fair and also at the University of Hiroshima, which is a sister school to USC. And we okay. were sort of sent there as a gift by the university. And at the time, a, an organization called the L.A. Bureau of Tourism, or L.A. Inc., as it was called, it's no longer a part of the mayor's office any longer. Um, but it was a tourism, L.A. tourism Okay. organization and and they also sent us to berlin three other times after after that sent us to europe oh sweet as a result of this and anyway yeah we started off as a student-led group and the goal was let's book gigs in the summertime you okay know, and, and book club dates and with me being from the northwest and all these guys being from california we were able to kind of line up all of our connections and mm-hmm. actually line up a pretty solid i-5 tour from here to seattle okay and we did that every summer and then 2008 and nine, we went through a couple different personnel changes and moved to a trio format. Okay. And then we've ha- that, then we had a Jeff Stein was in the band from 2010 to 2014, and then um, 
We released two albums during that time. And then Will Brom's been in it since 2015, and we've we've done a couple records since then as well, mm-hmm. a live record, and and yeah, and so we've done nine albums, and then we've we've gone and played in the Philippines and Indonesia and Japan and Europe and Canada, and then a lot of dates around the continental United States mm-hmm. and coastal, just yeah, each mi- each side. Yeah, actually the Midwest, the South. We've played in Texas. We've played um, in the Intermountain West. We've okay. played in uh, yeah, uh, at Georgia. We've played with Perry moving to New York in '09. We then started going out. We go to New York, stay with him, and then drive up to Boston and play mm-hmm. in Vermont and some stuff. So we've actually covered most of the U.S. at this point, and yeah, and and it's it continues to be a group that we do original music and then arrangements of popular covers. Okay. The shift in that group for the longest time, we really only did original music, and we also How popular like current on the charts. No, stuff, like or? we kind of st- the the thing that changed for us was when I did this arrangement of Everybody Wants to Rule the World because uh-huh. '80s new wave music works so well for us because there's this kind of shuffly groove that yeah. we can sort of do with an acoustic guitar. Sure. Plus, the baby boomer audience that were coming to see us just loved hearing 80s tunes sure. so we did the cover the police and, okay um, some paul simon nice and uh what paul simon tune? uh we did late in the evening All off right. one trick pony yeah you know there's been a few other things we've sketched out over the years cool so yeah and then and that when we started doing those arrangements then new west really the whole concept shifted and we started doing stuff that people recognized and then we would insert more difficult kind of our own original stuff in between all of it right you know and then that's that's been the model since then but nothing to ever alienate or it's not yeah it's artistic music and it's art music in the sense that it's three guitar players playing yeah. instrumental but it's not so artsy that it's we yeah you're gonna lose them we did man back in 2008 and nine we did <laughs> we did a whole show at kumbwa up in santa cruz entirely free we played for two <laughs> we played for two hours and totally free and and that was the extreme, and that was great. I mean, going what was the response like it was it was actually all right. I, you really? know, it was all right, and it was you know if there's a place to do that, Santa Cruz is the place to yeah. do it. Uh, where, where in Santa Cruz? Kumbua Jazz Center, great okay. venue up there. But um, we also would do we did all acoustic guitar shows. We did a lot of alternate tunings. Okay. Um, a lot of experimenting with pedals and effects. At some point, we really went overboard with that. And, um, Do you feel like it's settled in now, and like it's? Or are you guys still kind of looking into different corners of what can? Yeah. not only writing wise, but we've, sonically and we've touched uh, base concept. with yeah, we've touched base with a lot of the possibilities with that format, from playing an all acoustic show uh-huh. to doing a show with a vocalist to doing a show where we're playing like with the baritone guitar and the acoustic guitar and the nylon string guitar and sure. our j- jazz guitars, and now we're we're doing some really swinging stuff like okay. real straight ahead type of tune so right there you know that runs the gamut kind of for what we're what's going to suit the group best you know it would be kind of weird for us to do a Jimi hendrix thing where we're all playing fender strats right. or if we did something like you know steve reich electric counterpoint play yeah. these really dense written i love that record yeah it's beautiful yeah. and it's great and i've i've even arranged some things based on those kinds of pieces okay um we've adapted some pieces that were written for classical guitar ensembles like the LA Guitar Quartet and adapted that to our group but really I think the focus the 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 unique thing about New West is that blend of the acoustic guitar and the archtop guitar cuz okay. not a lot of, there's really not a lot of other guitar ensembles that do it like that sure and it's been fun too cuz the science of learning how to get a good steel string sound has just become a huge thing for us, you know, a huge focus. Uh, let's dive into that. It, yeah. In what sense? Yeah, like learning how to get a good acoustic guitar sound live. Okay. Um, it's Through just, a PA. Yeah. Okay. It, and, and in different rooms. I mean, it's such a battle to begin with. And so yeah. we, but that's what's so cool about being on the road with two other guitar players. Yeah. We can sit in the car for six hours between gigs and be like, man, how do we do this? Sure. How do you set the preamp? Right. Maybe if we try this. Maybe if three we guitar do that. players are going to want to talk here, of course. Yeah, and then yeah. we then we're we're at a gig and we're sound checking, and then you know one of us goes out and listens, and one of us plays, and sure. we're it just it's it it was man, it was like a whole nother level of education just nice. being on the road with other guitarists. Yeah, yeah, of course. And, and versus if you're the only guitar player, 
sometimes it's just like you, you don't really have any money to bounce these kinds of ideas right, off of. Right, right. And we're trying different instruments. You know, I have this really beautiful Jeff Traugott acoustic guitar, and we were trying some other guitars that were like not as pristine to think that maybe that would solve some of the acoustic guitar issues. Okay. But, what, did, what have you learned in this uh, process? Well, we've learned the value of a good sound guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We've learned the value of a good venue and a room that really is tuned right. Also, just... Um, Equipment-wise, is there yeah. anything that's like, there was this missing link that yeah. you discovered? Well, you know, the whole, just like, the, we're in the advent right now of the best pedals that are ever been built ever. Um, it's not like people are trying to go back and build a pedal board that was what people were using in the... 60s obviously sure, right so we're um there's this canada the canadian company called radial engineering and they make such great di products and sure. they make one that has the eq section built in it has a notch filter and a high pass filter and man that has be that has just been our swiss army knife we can okay. go in and play any venue with that and it works and then we learned that if we use condenser mics on all the guitars, not just the acoustic, but we just have pencil mics set up in front of us, yeah. it tightens the group sound so much, okay. especially in a big hall. Sure. But you have to be careful because it's so easy to cross the line with that kind of gear with a bad sound guy and get yeah. a really shitty sound. Sure. And a really feedbacky, horrible, bright, cr terrible yeah. sound. So we've had to fig we've had to really read these situations to. And man, I'm I'm so glad that's built a whole nother muscle for all of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now when I go on a gig with someone else and have to play acoustic guitar, I have all of this knowledge in my head about you know sonics and room. And, yeah, yeah. Oh, you know what? We're hearing this frequency. We should really dial out the. At 420, we should dial it out there, yeah. boost it at 1100, and you know, like you talk in those terms because we've, I've just learned over the years so much. Yeah, I, yeah. I almost wish I would have been able to keep a real accurate journal of all these experiences. Um, but, right. but we remember them. We we, yeah. <laughs> we talk a lot on the road about our horror experiences because sure. there's some very memorable experiences where literally we just had to stop the show. It was so bad. We'll get there. There's a, yeah. lot of, a question I like to ask a lot of guys is like a worst gig story. <laughs> oh, man. OK. I'll, uh, I'll, 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 maybe maybe keep yeah, that motor running. I'll think that. Yeah. So, OK. Yeah. So this is happening. USC kind of halfway through. You're starting this group. Uh, now, after USC, before right. Cal Arts, you're working a lot with them and you're teaching at local music stores. Yeah. You get into Cal Arts, you're doing, you're studying with Koontz. Yep. And you're teaching undergrads? Yeah. Okay. And non major guitar lessons. Yeah. And now is the degree in performance? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a Master of Fine Arts in Jazz Guitar Performance. Okay. Exa so it's exactly what I'm doing right now. Yeah. <laughs> Basically. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. Exactly, okay. MFA. And yeah. then, uh, so you graduate in what year? 2012. Oh, right, right. You said. And, you know, still a little bit of recession going on. It's not great, yeah. Yeah, but I was also very proactive while at CalArts to be on the road, and I was playing with Spencer, I started to play with Spencer Day a lot, and then I got the Jeff Goldblum thing going kind of at the end of 2012. And How'd that come about? Yeah, that just, you know, that gig's been going on for a long time, and... Um, I was called to sub one night okay. up there. Um, who think, is who's think, doing it before? I think Bruce was on it that night, Bruce Foreman, and then Anthony Wilson had played with him for a long time, too. Okay. And this was still, like, the residency in L.A. is a place called the Rockwell. Yeah, it wasn't a Rockwell yet. Okay. It was, at the time, it was at this place called the Lexington Social House, which isn't oh, yeah, there yeah, I know that place. Yeah. Uh, that's, like, what, Coanga and hollywood -ish? It's right, right below um, Capitol. Yeah, yeah. And it's gone so that's now. Vine, right? Yeah, it's yeah. on Vine, and it was um, yeah. Jeff was playing there at okay. that time. Yep, yep. And that was the end of 2012. That was like fall of 2012. I think that place is closed. It is closed. I did a couple gigs there. Yeah, cool it's room. closed. Yeah, yeah. It was really bonkers in there when we did those shows. It was just it was just kind of like a lot of people and a lot of drunk people and. We were just kind of doing karaoke, basically. Like people just want to come up. Oh, let's sing "Fever." I was like, oh, with yeah. with Jeff. Yeah, yeah and okay. then people were Instagram. You know, Instagram was really at its advent, and okay. so people started sharing on there, like, "Hey, I'm going to the right. Jeff Golden Jazz Night." And then when when that started, then pe more people started showing up, and we moved to Rockwell in 2013. Okay, because they had just undergone a renovation which turned the room into Rockwell. Prior to that, it was called the Upright Cabaret, which was just 
a third of the size of that room. And okay. the, the other two thirds of Rockwell where the stage is right now was another restaurant altogether. Oh, wow. It wasn't So you'd even, have to walk by a restaurant? It so was the layout closed is off. For anybody that's never been there, you yeah. walk in. Yeah. And to the left is the stage up against the outer wall. Yeah. Uh, then there's a restaurant off to the right. There's a bar. So you walk in and where the stage is is a restaurant. And then it's a, there's a wall separating it to something. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And the and that restaurant was it was closed for a lot of years. It had operated as a separate business, and then was just a vacant room. And I saw it. I had I played up at the Upright Cabaret with Spencer Day in 2010. Ten years ago, this coming February, we had a we had a month long residency there with David Arquette, the actor. Okay. He also plays trumpet. Oh really? <laughs> I tend to play with a lot of actors who play these <laughs> instruments. And um, Man, what what's his name? Mm-hmm. I want to say Peter. Geller, uh, Peter, yeah, Peter, Peter, um, Peter Weller, Weller, who was Robocop. Robocop. Yeah, right. Jeff. Have you Jeff played been, with him? I haven't actually done the gig with him, but Jeff played with him for twenty years, and okay. in, in this band that I do. I remember getting a call to do a gig at like some private cigar lounge with yep. him, mm-hmm. and I'm like, who's who's that? Yeah. And I look it up, and all that kept coming up is like RoboCop, and I think yeah. he had directed Dexter or something. Exactly, and he's now on. He lives in the East Coast now. Okay. Um, he knows his jazz history like yeah. really deep. He's a big jazz guy. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. There's a you know there's a lot of actors, a lot of guys in Hollywood who are really dialed into the to this music. Yeah. I've learned that with Jeff and um, and a lot of his friends that have come hung out with us. Okay. Ed, Ed Begley Jr. You know. Okay. I mean he yeah he I mean talk to him about a lot of iconic recordings and yeah. Listens to, he listens to a lot of jazz. Okay. He's a great drummer, you know. Oh, huh. Remember Spinal Tap? He's the drummer in Spinal Tap. When, oh, it's been so when, when, when he explodes on the bandstand, that's Ed Bagley. Jr. Okay. So, yeah, it's pretty funny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but, but, yeah, but, 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 yeah, I joined that band at kind of an interesting time because Jeff was kind of starting to do it again. But it was still really kind of underground at the at time. At the Lexington. Yeah, it wasn't really something that was promoted or advertised a lot. And it was just something that was kind of a word of mouth. Yeah, I think thing. I really started hearing about it around, and I have a lot of friends in the band. Um, yeah. I think I know everybody in the band. Actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Except Joe, I don't. I've never met Joe. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, but I know Gina. Right. Um. Anyways, but yeah, so probably around like m- somewhere in mid 2014 is when I really started to hear about it. Yeah, and that was that was exactly when. We went out and did the Carlisle in New York, and that that was the game yeah, changer. Yeah, just before that, because I remember was, that. That was the game changer for the whole thing. Okay. That's when it turned into this big deal that now Jeff's doing records, and we're, t- we're touring internationally. What happened there? Was there a write-up in the Times, or did he was yeah. he on The View or something back there? Well, Jeff was already starting to talk on his TV show interviews more about his jazz band. Okay. And then when we went to the Carlisle, it was a really highly anticipated gig okay and yeah everyone came to review it the wall street journal the times post and and the reviews were just glowing it said it was like the best thing that had happened at the carlisle in 20 years oh wow and the audience was on fire and jeff works the room like no one else i can imagine and they had some nice quotes about all about the musicians and it was it was huge it was really cool to get that kind of press Mm -hmm. especially the new york times that was it was great when we came back after that, we, we took the model of the show there where Jeff would do these bantering bits, kind of comedic bits between the songs, and and we just applied that to Rockwell, and then we would feature a vocalist every week, right. and and um, rather than have random person come up to sing with us, and oh, that's funny, they don't know the words to Autumn Leaves's, you know, just, it was just... A little bit more polished. Just classier, and yeah. more, you know, we just, we're taking it... A little more seriously, and then, um, yeah, and then, sadly, Zane passed away a couple months after that, and mm-hmm. then we've had James King play in the band, okay, and a few other saxophonists, and uh, the model just kept growing, and yeah. 2015, 2016, 2015, Jeff was doing a couple movies, so we were off for a lot of that year, okay. I remember, but then I was also, I was on the road with New West, I think we did 65 dates that year, so oh, wow. 2015 was an interesting year, I like shifted gears back to New West. Sure. Then in 2016, we, we started playing more regularly at Rockwell, at the end of that year, Jeff went to the UK to promote something and was on Graham Norton, 
And okay. Graham said, hey, why don't you play a tune with Gregory Porter? He's our guest tonight. And <laughs> they played a song together on TV, and Universal Music Group said, hey, we should, we should do this. have a, him yeah. do a record. Okay. And that spawned... The is Cap- Gregory on the record? No, uh, he is not on Capitol Studio Sessions. Okay. And, and that was our first album you know mm-hmm. i think they were trying to get him to do something with that but instead we got a couple other people from europe like till Bronner played trumpet okay. on it um amelda may yeah. big irish pop singer she was on there and yeah we did the record at capitol in may of last year okay and then that just from that then the press came out about it and then we started doing more gigs out of town with yeah. it and okay. then this past summer has been insane the glastonbury music festival and the stuff in europe and then we recorded a new album with jeff and it's going to be coming out sometime this fall cool and um, then is there going to be some touring through the holidays probably yeah um we don't know f- yet for sure um mm-hmm. it looks like we're going to go back to rockwell here in september okay uh, for some for maybe a couple gigs and um, yeah, so as as everything with that camp stuff is planned really last minute because of does, Jeff's schedule. Does Jeff really like the Rockwell? Because it seems like you could even go to a bigger room at this point. Yeah, you know, yeah, I think that there's well, we've we have done the gig in LA a few other places. What's mm. now called Delilah used sure. to be called what was that six oh sixteen oh nine or something for a minute. It was I've an, only known it as Delilah. Yeah, there was, that was another room before they remodeled it. We used to play shows it's a in there. Room. Yeah, we played shows in there. We played a couple other little one-off things but rockwell's just kind of become the home of it and yeah it works well because you know standing room only can fit with the tables you know almost 300 people and he sells it out every time we go in there so it's It's pretty big band pretty big stage that's yeah it works out pretty well and and that part of town is a good fit for the show yeah yeah. you know we get uh, you know because it's a younger crowd yeah and a hipper crowd if it was hollywood it would be full of tourists and stuff sure like if we did it at Catalina's, you know. So Rockwell's been great, yeah. Cool. And I have a feeling we'll just we'll keep keep going there. And um, there's talks of doing other kinds of shows, you know, more of a showroom kind of thing, and with more guests. And I don't know. We'll see. Well, I guess we'll just have to see how everything kind of moves forward. And and um, but it's been it's been really fun and exciting. And the model that's working now seems to be working well the bet it seems like jeff is the most comfortable in that situation and he can really be himself perfect and you know he's that guy practices more than most musicians i know That's he's awesome. so dedicated he's yeah. all, that guy puts 110 percent into everything he does yeah including the, the including his music okay and, and he's uncompromising and so it's a good that's a good gig because he, he i think he just he feels really comfortable in there yeah you yeah know? Um, yeah. so now this is also kind of like a good, a divine intervention, so to speak. You have the break from that when yeah. the record's coming out. Yeah. Did you purpose the record release for this or how did you know, like, did Jeff give you like, Hey, we're going to have some time off. And then you're looking at the, the new West calendar. Like, all right, got some time off. I'm going to No, it was, it's, it's, it's like for so many musicians, it's a game of Tetris and sometimes <laughs> yeah. all the pieces fit perfectly and sometimes they all get stacked on top of one another and you sure. have to pick and choose. Yeah. By whatever luck I had, um, back then that worked out. And then recently with my record, I, I've been very committed to getting a record done in recent years yeah. and saving up the money and I didn't want to crowdfund it. I just wanted to do it all myself. Sure. And um, let's set up the record. The title yeah. of the record is what? The, the title of the record yeah. is Ponderosa, and it is a duo record with you and Josh Nelson. Josh Nelson. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Josh, brilliant piano player. Uh, Natalie Cole. Uh, yeah. He does it. She's got his own records out. Oh yeah, he's played with everyone. Yeah, and he's kind of he's the guy now, really, in L.A. of our generation. Who's you know so. he's like a Billy Childs of our generation yeah. here for sure. Did he produce it as well? Did you guys co-produce? <laughs> kind of co-produced it. I didn't actually give a producer title on this recording because even on my engineer Paul Tabner gave me a lot of tips, especially on the okay. vocal stuff. You know, and and uh, I didn't go about hiring a producer. I knew the tunes I wanted to do. I knew sure. the story I wanted to do. But Josh and I, we we worked a lot on the music together and started rehearsing in 2018 and then recorded it about exactly a year ago, August of, of 2018. Okay. With the writing process for it, was it to write one piece of art as a record or was it to write tunes with different feels? And then like maybe there's five extras and let's just see which ones work, which ones get cut. 
Yeah. It, it, well, actually, what happened was there were a few tunes that I knew I wanted to do on the record, mm-hmm. like the song California, which yeah. I had recorded with New West in 2007. And okay. I've always wanted to redo it and do it a little differently mm-hmm. than that. And then I knew I wanted some instrumental, some swinging stuff. Yeah. And there was a couple other tunes and a couple other vibes that I wanted. Yeah. So I started kind of piecing the record around that and then picked... I also wanted a tune like that Sergio Mendes tune, So Many Stars, um, so that DJs would see a track like that and they would know the tune and then want okay. to play it. Versus if it was all originals. I was a curious hard. about that one, actually. Yeah, it's a little hard. I was curious why that pick. Yeah, well, and it also it's a, it's got a nature theme mm-hmm. and it's there's a bit of a question mark to that song. Yeah. And that's that's this record, the story of this record has a bit of that question at the end about what's next mm-hmm. a little bit. And, it, in, and, it, and it's in closing to this time in my life when I was home in Oregon and have moved down here. And uh, I really like the melody to that song a yeah. lot. I, I like the, um, I like kind of how it's, it's the, you can interpret that song as a romantic song or just simply as a personal, you know, expose about, you know, what you're doing with your life. I, yeah, I kind of yeah, like it's that. It's a little existential. Yeah, I kind of like that. And I knew it'd be kind of a cool way to end end the record um but um or to put put towards the end but but yeah but the but back to your question too about the writing it really just all kind of fit together and each time i'd rehearse with josh i'd have a new arrangement okay and then a new concept and um i also took the new west model a little bit with the acoustic guitar sound and doubled mm-hmm. the acoustic to get some more energy on some tracks sure. so that it wasn't just one track of guitar and one track of piano. Yeah. Yeah, I remember it's a uh, it's a track pretty early on on the record. I think I can't remember how the exact intro of it goes, but you kind of start out with that Matheny style double time pretty fast strumming. strumming yeah, thing. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that adds a nice energy to the whole piece. Yeah, and I wanted, you know, there had to be some more up tempo stuff on there, and yeah. that I wanted that, and and again, like for people that have listened to the New West stuff so much, I wanted this to be something that they would put right in that playlist. Okay, you know, and that's that's a New West kind of sound, yeah, the strumming guitar sound for sure. Okay, um, but yeah, that that was fun to put together, and Josh along the whole way, great ideas and great stuff, and yeah. and then. By the time we went into the studio, it was all pretty, pretty set. Together. The only thing that took me some time pretty much the whole year to work on was the vocals. Sure. And I kept going in and working on the vocals and giving it a shot and giving it a shot and then listening back. And How do you, you kind of um, – so what's your history with singing? Let's start. You, yeah. you sing on the record. Yeah. And there's, um, there's one tune on there that uh, – Definitely feels like a nod to James Taylor, which yeah. I'm a big James Taylor fan. So oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then there's some stuff that I can't really define the quality of why. And it's not just because it's a jazz musician singing, but there's a there's a Chet Baker thing. Yeah. <coughs> uh, that's, in the delivery. That's where, I, that's where my vocals come from, definitely with Chet, but also like Kenny Rankin. Okay. And James Taylor. Yeah. Um, and other kind of folksier guys, even Jim Croce. Yeah. I grew up singing a lot of Peter, Paul, and Mary and John Denver. Okay. And so those the, the vocal quality is very um, kind of high tenor, mm-hmm. nasally kind of stuff. And I, you know, and I sang a lot of country music as a kid. So that that's where my vocal quality does come from. Chet Baker, of course, is just a real natural transition into jazz because right. of his kind of higher voice and. Um, yeah, and that's definitely been kind of the sphere I'm in versus being like a big baritone, deep voiced guy, Johnny Hartman kind of singing right, right, right. or <laughs> operatic or I don't use a lot of vibrato, you know. Right. I, I think that maybe that's the quality to the Chet thing because mm-hmm. um, yeah. at least when I listen to Chet, it's like the, the non-singer vocalist. Yeah. You know, like he's not he's not really laying it on thick with the – Yep. Uh, all that you get it. Uh, I don't know how else to describe it, but yeah, yeah, and 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 that was that's where I'm coming from. I wanted it to be raw. I mm-hmm. wanted the vocals to be really like storytelling, like yeah, because the instrumental stuff people can engage differently with that. And then when I'm more telling this this story, no pun intended, <laughs> right. um, it it uh, um, 
it, yeah, it just sounds more organic. I wanted people to, to have the experience like they're just listening to me in a living room, not something that's like overly produced, overly compressed. Right, with, and with a bunch of like vocal hooks. Yeah, yeah, nope, nope, and exactly. It's not. It's. I mean, all yeah. the writing is very strong narratives all the way through. Yeah, man. So that, that was where I came from with it. And um, I also knew... A lot of things about this record before I did it, I, lo- I knew a lot about what I didn't want to do. Like, I did not want to do an entirely swinging, straight-ahead jazz record. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to do something that was covering all sorts of old standards from the 30s and 40s. Sure. I didn't want to do an album of all original music. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to do something that was purely instrumental. Yeah. I didn't want to do something that was mostly instrumental with one track, me singing at the end as like, right. here's a surprise. I needed to tell this story. I wanted it to be rootsier. I needed that acoustic guitar to be really at the center of it. Yeah. Because then my next project I can do, I can break this off into a couple different things. Like I envision myself now doing maybe a couple different kinds of EPs, one being a really straight ahead thing. Okay. And another one being almost all acoustic guitar and voice. Right. You know, and, okay. and so, so those you're are really setting the stage. For some different avenues yeah. that you're going to invest into specifically. Totally. And I'm, I'm all about these days musicians not feeling conformed to a genre. And, and of course, right. we have total creative control over what we do. And that is, the best of, that is the best thing about our time is that we really don't have the mercy. We aren't at the mercy of some company that tells us what we have to do right. because of what we've done before. Mm-hmm. And so we have to go out and make it ourselves and we right. have to pay for it ourselves and we have to make it happen ourselves. So I've, and I love that creative freedom because I look back now at like new West, especially those nine records. And that was a pure entire collaboration with the guys in the band of, at the time of each of those bands. Mm-hmm. And nobody forced us into any kind of box to do stuff and as a result you look back on those records i'm really proud of that work that we've done that's right you know and that's how i feel about this how did it feel doing this without the collaborative effort yeah like just did you feel like uh uh-oh uh-oh like i'm not used to well i i tried to get a lot of opinions about the singing like i played the singing for some some of my vocalist friends and they gave me some tips here and there okay and that really helped um yeah the, the the biggest thing i had to that I discovered about this project is how important deadlines are and yeah. setting deadlines for yourself and right. book, booking the rehearsal. I, I paid my engineer, Paul Tavener in advance for the recording dates and uh, it was way out. And I said, I'm doing the recording these to two give days. yourself a target. Yeah. I don't care if I get called for some huge gig that day. I don't care if, if Goldblum needs me to go somewhere, they're going to need a sub because those are the two days okay. I'm doing my record. Fortunately for me, I didn't have any conflicts. Yeah. 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 Because that would have really sucked. Yeah, and I'm sure if, if it got down to it and I had to move it a week back, no big deal. Sure. That wasn't the, the point was that I put that pressure on myself, that economic pressure. Yeah. And everything else is like, I'm getting this done. I'm doing yeah. this. Yeah, no, there's the, so much to being deliberate yeah. about things. Because in the past, I, I every year I do a goal sheet over the holidays and I put it on my computer and it's on my desktop all year. And sometimes I print it off and sometimes it's on my, on these days on my iPhone notes. Yeah. And, you know, you can put down the goal, like, going to do a record this year, and my budget is this, and I want to have these people on it. Okay. And that's great. That's great. But if you don't have the actual days you're meeting with the people, right. and you haven't actually taken that money out of your savings and paid somebody that money even sure. in advance, chances are it won't get done. No, it won't get done at all. And it's like right now, my, my health and fitness, I've had, I've had a lot of success this year, losing about 30 pounds so far. And it's the same thing. It's like... Yeah. I've set deadlines for myself, which yeah. some people don't recommend with that because your body, you know, your body's going to lose whatever weight it's going to lose. But I told myself, look, by the end of the summer, I am going to be in the well, you know two fifties, you sure. know, because sure. I was yeah, two ninety five in January. Oh wow! And so I'm going to be in the two fifties, and okay. I'm I'm five pounds away from that right That's now. That's great, man! Congratulations. Thanks. Yeah. But it's same thing. So it's like you have the goal, but you. <coughs> the next step with the goal is you have to use long division and figure out. Yeah. Now, over what period of time is this goal going to get done? Sure, realistically. Yep. And yeah. when you do a record, like there's all sorts of mini goals. First of all, of course, the music has to be in place. Yeah, getting the tunes together. And you may not know what it totally is, and that's part of that process. But yeah. you still need to set deadlines for yourself. All right, I'm going to do six rehearsals, and there's going to be ten tunes. Therefore, each rehearsal has to have, you know, one point. Yeah. Two five songs done or whatever, <laughs> yeah. so I need to I need to have that done. Sure. And if I don't have it done, 
then I'm going to be doing this record and it's just going to be three tunes, you know, right. and, and, and it, it, it helped. And when you have the right people to collaborate with, like Josh as your quarterback too, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's, it's great. And that's, that's why it's so important in this business to have teamwork and to be a good team player, mm-hmm. be prepared for somebody to come up and be like, Hey man, I want you to play on my record. Can you know, and then for you to be like, yeah, man, I'll support that. Let's yeah. f- let's figure out when we can rehearse and just be a real team player right. because you're going to need people like that in your career to right. get to get your dreams and goals done. Agreed. You know, even people at the very top who are signed to mega, mega, mega deals and have millions and millions of dollars, the the you know these pop stars, even they need teamwork. They need. Yeah, I mean, it's always a team. They no, need it's... people to help them. You know. And with those people, there's so many more decisions that have to be made. I mean, how, with the right. luxury of us being kind of, you know, middle of the road musicians, is we just, we just, there's no economic liability for me. I can put right. out, I can literally, I can put out a polka record if I wanted to. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I'm not gonna. That's put an out a option. Polka That's an option. <laughs> um, so, how have you been navigating? How would you speak to the do-it-yourself? You have the record, and now you don't want. A thousand of them underneath your coffee table for the rest of your life. Ah. <laughs> how are you? How are you dealing with market uh, marketing it distribution? Yeah. What did you learn from New West to help yeah. book tours? How would you speak to? I mean, because that's a big world out there. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I don't know if anybody has really fully understood how to navigate, but you've yeah. had some success at it with New West. Yeah, we actually New West, and I think this record too lie in a small genre in music that still CDs are still valuable. You know. Mm-hmm. If I was putting out pop music and house music, it would be pointless for me to make a CD because right. it's all people DJs. Yeah, yeah. All right, but the world I'm in, there's older people who like this music, and sure. they come, and the people that come to performing arts centers want to have a something signed at the end of the night, even okay. if it's the concert program, and a lot of them are more than happy to give you an extra ten, twenty dollars for that disc. Right. They may never even play it, but right. you've given it to them. Right. They're walking away with Yep. And we found out with New West and there's been a lot of discussions over the years about okay, when do we stop ordering physical product? And I'm like, well we go on the road and we make an extra six hundred dollars. I mean that's that's real money. Yeah, I'll yeah. I'll take six hundred dollars. You sure. know so with my thing, first of all, I just printed five hundred mm-hmm. <laughs> and half of them went to the radio stations right away. Okay. And so you got K Jazz. Yeah, K Jazz is going to play it, and Mark Rennie of Groove Marketing is doing my radio promotion for me. He's excellent, I highly recommend him, especially in jazz. So He's does the he best. do PR to get it to the station? A little bit of PR. He sends off the press release, and you know it's it's. But as with radio stuff, him just being the guy who's servicing the record, mm-hmm. um, DJs will just be checking that out okay. for that sake of that, you know. So. Yeah, so I'm. I've always been happy with him. He's always had great results. Okay, and he's a really he good with guy. New West. Yeah, he's okay. done several records with us with New West, and um, so I'm doing that. And then instead of hiring a publicist, I'm imagining I'm going to be spending over the next year probably a couple thousand dollars in just Facebook ads and Instagram ads. I feel like that's more important now than spending five grand on a publicist to go get you five articles and some magazines. I mean, so, but then the. Uh, the other thing you got to wonder is, like, what's the nature of a magazine anymore? True. I don't know. Like, yeah. when you were coming up, did you uh, read Guitar Player Magazine All, or I Downbeat mean, or whatever? I had stacks of Downbeats yeah. and stacks of Jazz Times. And sure. I, I, I'd go to Borders. I'd yeah, pick too. up that one. My, and then mine. I'd go pick up a couple CDs. And sometimes I'd look in them and see who's on the cover. Like, I remember one time Dave Holland right. was on the cover. And I was like, oh, who's this? Yeah. And I'd go over to the CD section. And there's these beautiful ECM discs that are $22 right. a piece. And there's Dave Holland quintet with yeah. chris potter and them a beautiful blue cover and i was like yeah. well okay i'll buy this and i went home and i was like whoa yeah what, what is what's this happening this here? is <laughs> these guys are so good but i don't know are they playing changes and yeah so you know that was how it was in the late 90s and the early 2000s until until itunes quick tangent coming from the guitar player or yeah. the teacher who said this is jazz and this isn't yeah how did you when you got back around to checking out the uh more and more modern guys the guys that are still living yeah today how did you process that music yeah well uh, some of them are i was like well this isn't really something i could see myself doing you mm-hmm. know 
I, I also like the imagery of the, the consummate jazz guitar player, like the Howard Roberts guy that's sitting on a stool okay. <laughs> playing a ho- big hollow body. I, and I, I saw myself as being that image. So okay. if I heard jazz that was a little bit outside that, like Ornette Coleman, mm-hmm. it's like, oh, I'm not going to. Well, I mean, he's outside of everything. Yeah, I'm, so I'm not going to pay attention to this. this yeah. is, but, you know, as I got deeper and deeper into it, I was like, well, actually, you know, yeah, there is so much of the of of what I do want to do in all these people's music, you know. And mm-hmm. Pat Metheny, I started getting more into Metheny, sure, you know, and Schofield. Yeah, both of those guys I hadn't heard on record, and I saw them <laughs> live, and that was where I heard them the first time. I heard Pat okay. Trio with Bill Stewart and Larry Grenadier, and that was the first time I'd ever even heard oh, Pat. Oh man, that was an amazing trio. It was an awesome. It was the Trio '99 tour, yeah, and yeah, I, I saw love, him, and I was that. just totally blown away. But I, th- I did leave the concert being like, is that jazz? Or right. is it like instrumental craziness? Sure. And could I see myself doing that? Because I knew I wanted to be a professional musician. I knew I wanted to go out there and do that. So I was constantly listening to stuff and sizing it up based on, well, is that what I could do? Or right. well, I, can't, I can't see myself rocking out in front of an audience with a saw body guitar or cranked with a synth patch. That's, yeah. just, not, <laughs> that's just not me. Yeah. It, I'd have to have a major life turn of event to be like sure. that. Then it turns out that you go out and be a professional guitar player and you end up doing kind of all of this stuff. Yeah, 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 you right. know, and it's There's not that. like you just do one thing. But yeah, I, I was so mag so back to your question too, like about publicity and magazines. Back when the brick and mortar stuff was was real and the internet was in its infancy, oh yeah, I mean it was so essential. Sure. And these days it's great to get articles in those magazines and I love downbeat. I love checking that stuff out, but um I think what is leading us to other gig opportunities and other collaborations with musicians is just how we're posting on our social media pages. And sure. and if you cross intersect with these people in real life, like when I'm on tour with some of these bands, they'll reach out to me and ask for a lesson. And that's where it yields kind of that economic flow that maybe would have been in place 20 years ago where you'd hire the publicist, get the article, and then get booked to booked a gig right or your booking agent would hustle a gig because you weren't on this magazine and these days it's just it's so different the the booking gigs thing is so different than it was then too and so is it um do you do a lot of the administrative work for new west yeah yeah perry and i share that role almost exclusively and then so you have that skill set going into booking your record is it just yeah Simple as using your contacts and shooting them another email. Kind of, and out of respect to all the work we've done for New West, I'm not going to necessarily dig into all our contacts and try to book gigs with sure. this band. However, um, yeah, I mean, what I've learned from New West is it takes a lot of persistence, and like mm-hmm. you sit down and send 30 emails and get no responses, you right. know, and and that's the reality. So, um, yeah, I mean, this. Now, is what's your move there? No response. Do you do, yeah. you, do you send a follow email? Depends. Depends on how much I believe in the gig. Okay. Um, I also, if I don't get responses from guys, then I try to use my contacts and call people who've had success with with people and be like, hey, what's it like dealing with this guy? Yeah, yeah. A common response is, oh, he's really hard to get a hold of. Sure. Or, oh, he'll just email you out of the blue. Or, oh, well, you really should, best thing is to text him. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. these days, uh, there's a couple presenters I talk to almost exclusively on Facebook. Okay. And that'll be soon probably going to Instagram too, you know? Yeah. Um, and so... It's about being organized and being aware of what you're really going for. And sure. then some places are just very e- – it's a very easy pipeline to a gig. You know, bars and clubs that just book a lot of music right. have to book a lot of music. So you email them and you have a specific date. And if you're professional and very clean with your delivery and you just give it to them and say, here's my band. I'm coming through town on this day. Can you – are you, would, would you book me? Yeah, yeah. S- and if you've done your homework and looked on the calendar and see they haven't booked the date yet sure. – you know, versus if they've already got somebody booked, yeah, um, it's a great way to not get a response right there. Right, 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 right. But yeah. if you've done your homework and then you do it the right way, um, yeah, I've found a lot of success with that. But also, I've kept a lot of detailed data over the years about who I've reached out to for a long time okay. and how they've responded. Because there's some presenters you go do a gig with and you don't want to work with them again. Or... You feel gypped, or or the deal wasn't as good, or you know you could negotiate a better deal next time. Right, and you have to have some history with mm-hmm. that. And um, do you have contracts on all these? Yeah, and now we have a booking agent with okay. West, so the contracts go through the booking agent. Now, do they? Does the booking agent procure the gig? Yeah, or? they okay. do now. And, and we have kind of a non-exclusive deal with our agent where we can go out and book some gigs for okay. the band, but. 
but it doesn't really behoove our relationship well to do that because the incentive needs to be on the agent to go book the gig. Sure, sure, sure. Because Incent- you have to pay them regardless whether they get it or not. Yeah. Well, well, they just take a commission. Okay, of they each take one a they commission book. on the gig. So if they don't book any gigs, they don't make any money. Right. We don't make any money, and then nobody wins. But, yeah, yeah. but I've. You know, I've done some stuff like hustled a few things that I knew have have a good budget. Okay. That I can that, and and then just been like, okay, before we negotiate this, why don't you get in touch with our agent and they'll deal with it, and then that'll inspire the agent to go book a couple more things. Nice. And that's the that's the that's what we need to do going forward with that band because we've spent a. 15 years doing the booking ourselves so it's time to move forward and have the letterhead in the band have that agency name on it and have it be a like okay new west if you want to book new west then you need then talk to these people yeah yeah well and it frees up everybody a little bit so you can yeah and do that same work but now on your own record right exactly yeah and i mean i'm i mean i i'm not interested in i don't need a booking agent for myself or for this this is something i can go out because my goal with with ponderosa within this album cycle which these days i think album cycles for people like us in the creative spirit can be almost as long as a couple years you can mm-hmm. be pushing a record for a long time um and making vi- making new videos and then new put content up, on the same put up a new video of one of the tunes from the record sure. and boom all of a sudden your record is brand new again yeah. you know and so i'm it's because man there's like as a viewer you just there's so much coming at you all the time yeah that if you were going to you know put up a video on the record or do some some of your own press on the record in two months, I've seen so much of people's, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I've seen so much of that. So totally. then it's almost like new again or a reminder, just like a little tap on the shoulder of like, hey, check it out again. Yeah. You know, and you, yeah, you're right. You can get a lot, a la, la, solid run, some longevity yeah. out of. Yeah, and you know, record. it's about these days, I think, for, for self financing musicians, it's about getting really creative and making your dollar go really far. So if you put $15,000 into your record, you want to get $30,000 of stuff out of that. And, and sure. how do you do that? You create new content, you, you make, a, make a phone post of you just doing one of the songs from the record or talking about the record or a podcast about sure. the record. And then you put that out and it just, it spins the record in a new way. It doesn't yeah, yeah. like have a shelf life. You know, records used to have kind of this shelf life, right? Six to eight weeks. And then it was old news. And so it was like, really, is that a statistic? Well, I've read a lot about kind of how record labels pushed albums in the sixties and seventies. And yeah, you'd be surprised wow. a very short period, a month, month or two would go by and then the record wouldn't be on the front display. They'd put new stuff on the front display. Okay. Yeah. But, but then what would be the deal? The band would be touring it or something. So that, well, I think that, that, that the press is, they're coming to the town near you. Yeah. I mean, and then the band would be touring the record. Sure. And then when the tour was done, they wouldn't be, t- they wouldn't tour the record again. They'd work on another record. Right. They'd go to another Plus record. Plus the record, the obligations you had with your record deal in those times were within so many years, you would do five records for them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you were getting paid to do that. So for us, when you're paying to do, nobody, there's no push to do you can do one record and make it last for six years if you want you know so um yeah so with with (laughs) with with my album you know i'd love to see myself book 10 nice gigs this year with it around the country at some Mm -hmm. things and because it's mainly a duo record i can hook up with whatever piano players in the area yeah i was gonna ask about that josh is a busy guy yeah and and josh and i can book some stuff and i i want to make it worth it for him because you know he's he's the best yeah i did a really great run of dates in portland with nico seropoulos who was here you know and nico's played the music and killed it sounded so good he's got a great record out yeah he's a good he's he's a great guy i love yeah Nikos. absolutely so yeah and and even even do a full rhythm section thing and then just do a few tunes from this record and then play some tunes there's another thing about being a jazz musician is i can always right. go do a set where i'm just putting in some some quick arrangements of some tunes a couple originals and then a few things from my record sure you know so sure. yeah and 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 with the press about jeff's new record coming out this fall that'll help me also just go to people and be like i've got this record out do you want me to come out and yeah do this a lot of Schools are interested in me coming and presenting my concert booking touring class that I do a seminar on, and I talk a lot about strategies when you leave school sure. of how to go get a gig and um, how you can set reasonable goals and what you might want to expect if in our in our creative world. And 
it's also turning into this set thing where people are now knowing I'm doing higher profile gigs. So they're asking, well, what's it, how do you build a career in Los Angeles where you're playing with high profile mm-hmm. people and doing that sort of stuff? So it's kind of interesting. Part of the class is like DIY sure. grassroots and the other part of the class is, OK, I'll give you a little bit of a story about how I took 10 years to build a career and now I'm doing these gigs. Right, right, right. You know, so it's. I mean, so much of it, I would assume, in this master class is going to talk about uh, the goals and the the thing you kind of already talked about about it all. That's your that's your baseline, so to speak, of that all these things are built off. Of. Yeah, and you know, it's, you forget when you're a, when you're a, a working adult and you've been out of college a few years, you forget that college kids, you know, they need advice on like how to write an email. You know, mm-hmm. like, yeah. like be clear and direct, sure. know how to describe your music in a sentence that right. like you could, t- you could tell your mom's bridge friends what your, what your music sounds like. Yeah. Because most of the time when you're trying to get a gig, you, you're talking to somebody and you don't really know what their background is. No. They may know nothing about jazz and yet this or could be Or how a- long, how much time they're going to spend reading the email. Yeah. You need to make it in and out. Yeah. And, and we, the creative part of what we do is not a big part about getting a gig really no. getting a gig involves certain skills and a certain dynamic and it's a little relationship and it's a projection of how you see yourself in your career sure. and if we are always stuck in our right brain and our creative sphere and you're a little living in your little vacuum writing all your music and then you try to go out and get a gig like that you're going to be denied real quick because people aren't going to believe that they can put you on the calendar and get anybody to come see that <laughs> right, right, right. versus exactly. if you're like look here's what i do here's how here's why it works in your venue yeah check out this video i, I you know would you would you be interested in booking it on this date thanks for the consideration sure. you know and if and college students don't know this because they live there they they're in a music major Right. And they're living in the creative sphere. So I try to give them a little bit of like, all right, let's role play. You're going to email me right now. You're going to okay. describe to me your music and I'm going to tell you if you get the gig or not. You yeah. know, And that's what that class, that class is a lot about that. And then it's also about a, a procedure and organization and how the value of collaborating with people along the way can really help you go a lot farther than if you leave school and you just try to do all of this on your own. Sure. You know. And that's that's just the reality of it. You yeah, know? yeah. I mean, these days, economically, it's the reality of it, and we have to. Um... The other thing too, I try to really instill in them without telling them directly, is the notion that musicians are poor is just bullshit. It's not real. They're like we can be broke and poor, but we also can be economically stable and organized sure. and strategic. And we can make ourselves comfortable enough so that we can go out and take some risks. Yeah, yeah. And do a, like I did this record, and I self did this whole thing myself. You sure. know, and uh, you know, because these students are leaving school and they're having a lot of doubts in themselves, and their society is doubting them, and they're even their families are saying, "Well, when are you going to get a real job?" So. Th- this whole notion I try to ins- show them that I never believed that I never once believed that you have to be a poor musician sure and you know you can be a poor doctor too you can be a poor lawyer right so you might as well not be a poor musician you know? but now how would you speak to the mentality of I'll get by with my playing yeah right because there's there's a <laughs> there's a naivety uh-huh. what's the, whatever the being naive whatever the word naivete. is naivete there it is um, to that, yeah. that like, oh no no no, they'll hear me play and yeah. I'll get the gig. Yeah, and then you're just in. It's yeah. changed a lot. I'm 37. You're 35. Yeah. Okay, you, you know, so yeah. it's changed a lot since we were that yeah. age. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that age still permeates school or not, but well, uh, music students today, I think, are actually more open than ever to the possibilities of what they're doing with their career almost too much so mm-hmm. uh, i talked to my i have a student who's at usc and he tells me most of the music majors are on their laptops all the time and they're sure. trying to write beats and then they're trying to write lyrics and then they're working on songwriting and then they're they're and they're trying to learn charlie parker tune versus you know when i was in school i was transcribing all the time yeah I did not have time to take a Pro Tools class. I right. did not have time to do a songwriting class. I did not have time to be paying attention at all to hip hop music. I just focused on jazz. You know? I, I I agree with both sides of this because I think that there's a level of 
you need to be hyper focused on something. Right. Because you have the rest of your life and career to learn everything else. And that same level of focus will then get into that. So if you're, mm-hmm. you know, if, when you're in college, if you're focusing on bebop and that's your thing, it's like, boom, all right, right, this is my, for four years, then when you get into something else, maybe it's arranging or booking or whatever your new skill set that you're learning is, you're going to have that same focus. And it goes back to your goals situation. Like, yeah. I'm going to, I got these goals, I'm knocking these out, then yeah. the well, no snowball. I think if you talk to every professional musician who's successful and you ask them, are you doing anything what you thought you would when you left music school, they'd all laugh. And be like, I'm, <laughs> I had no idea I'd be doing this. Right. Necessity is the mother of invention. You know, right. Matt King Cole said that about his trio, and that was why he started the trio without the drummer, because his bandstand he played at over there on La Brea at the Swanee Inn was too small to have drums. And then that was the <laughs> birth of the modern jazz trio. I didn't know this. Right, yeah, actually. it's like why Oscar Peterson used that format and why okay. Diana Krall uses that format, you know, the drum, the, the uh, bass, guitar, piano thing. Sure. So he he came to L.A. thinking he'd have a big band. It was the right. 30s. Everybody had a big band. And then yeah. he got this little gig, and he had to just make it work, and he had to come up with shout choruses. And then look, that's and Nat King Cole was born from right. that. So, yeah, it's cool that kids are open in you college. Do, you do a thing like that, right? Yeah, I have, a trivia, I have a show. That's, yeah, it's, uh. yeah, I've studied a lot of history of Nat, and we do a show on the history of Nat King Cole. Right. Yep. And we talk, there's a narrative. We okay. talk about Nat, and we talk about the music. Peter Smith on piano. Peter Smith, Alex, Alex Frank, Frank on, bass, on bass. Who's also doing Gold Bloom right now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and Spencer Day. So, um, yeah, and, and it's, again, it's cool that k- most college kids seem to be kind of open to that. Cool. And then um, it's it's just the, the thing is we have to hone our craft, and there has to be a point where what you mentioned earlier where we're like, my playing will get me out there, and I'm going to do this. Mm-hmm. That That is the spirit that puts us into the competitiveness of what we do. And then people usually get out of that in one or two ways. One being very narcissistic (laughs) and not rejoicing in other people's success and counting all their likes on Facebook and seeing who follows them. And it's all me, 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 me. And, oh, that guy is jealous, must be jealous of me or I'm jealous of him. So there's, there's a large crew of narcissism out there. Then the other people come through that and they're like, look, my playing got me to this point but now i'm doing some teaching and i'm inspired by that and i'm working on my music this way and i'm happy to be doing this gig and i've got this opportunity in front of me and i'm not yet doing this in my career but i'm gonna make this happen in my career and so both of those are spawned out of that sort of um feeling of i'm gonna go win on my instrument yeah and i think all of us unless you're really like totally not of sound mind understand that the chances of us going out there and making a living performing immediately after school and only performing your own original music is just nil unless you're independently wealthy you know right. or joey alexander or someone that's been chosen as a prodigy and then you, sure. that's it so the so being being that working musician being uncompromising with what you do and being saying like okay i'm gonna be really undeniably good at this mm-hmm. While always being like, yeah, but I could I could apply that to this and I could apply that to this. And then have you answered the question for yourself? Yeah. Uh, not, not that there's any like a time period in which it should or not be uh, answered. Maybe some people address it. Maybe not. I don't know. Have you ever asked yourself and answered uh, what is success for me? And come to terms with your own concept right. so that you can take this burden off of yourself. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I feel like um, I've – it's been a – this year has been a big time of reflection for me with my album and with just some – Is gig- that pretty cathartic going through yeah. all that? Yeah, and I've I've actually – you know, I was sharing that with my family. I was talking – my mom was visiting recently. We were talking a lot about this. And um, – yeah, I mean, I, f- I do legitimately feel like I'm doing everything I, I wanted to do when I was in high school and when I wanted to go be a professional musician. Mm-hmm. And I'm doing even more stuff than I even realized I'd be doing. Sure. I didn't realize I'd be juggling five road gigs. I didn't right. realize I would also be maintaining a less, private lesson studio, like 20 students all over Los Angeles. Oh, wow. And Where do you teach at? I just go to people's homes where they oh, come here. Yeah, okay. these days I'm kind of full. <laughs> Great. But, but at the same time, it's... 
I knew I'd be teaching, but I didn't know that much. And I knew I'd be on the road, but I didn't know that much. I also yeah. didn't understand the economic strata at the time of what it takes to really pay the rent as a musician. Yeah. And now I'm like, oh, that's what it, that's how many gigs I need. <laughs> that's yeah. how many lessons I need to teach sure. to pay the rent. So I do feel like I'm doing what I wanted to do. And to me, I, that, that's success. And mm-hmm. also, the the things that I have yet to do in my career... Um, I have a lot of stuff on the teaching side. Like I'd love to be more involved at a college and and teach more at the college level someday when I'm not on the road as much. Faculty or adjunct faculty? I'm adjunct. already doing adjunct work. So yeah, maybe more adjunct work or adjunct work at a different kind of college um, here in LA somewhere and and writing curriculum for people learning the guitar. I'm working mm-hmm. on a bunch of online teaching right now with elite sure. guitarists and that's okay. helped me kind of focus on, okay, what what are to me the touchstones of being a jazz guitar player and how do I get people at the basic level in learning this stuff, you know? Now, let me ask you so. this, just uh, musician to musician, yeah. not that anything, it's, it's been uh, that otherwise, but right. when you get into that realm of the online lessons, I think to myself, related to the bass, I'm not going to give them anything new. Mm-hmm. Like... The internet's been around. Someone's already posted a video on a different way to think about the fretboard or how do you navigate that to to bring this kind of freshness to it? Well, I feel lucky that the platform I'm using, this website, is really great. And they already have a lot of people paying attention to their classical and flamenco track. Okay. And then Larry Kuntz and I are doing... Do you the j- teach a lot of that? Because that's I your- don't. Okay. I, 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 I am now a closet classical guitar player. Okay. I cannot compete with the guys out there that are playing sure. classically. Um, it's just not in my... It's also not how I hear music anymore, too. Uh, like, yeah, if I that. play classical guitar now, I sound like I swing stuff. Oh, really? Because yeah. I'm a jazz guy. You know? Right. I'd be like a classical guy playing the 12-hour blues. You know? So, <laughs> um, But... I'm lucky that the platform is really great and that's half the battle, the branding of the platform, because people know they're going to consistently get the right content from this one place. Right. And they look forward, they anticipate to what the next content is. So if if you're out there just trying to do it yourself and put it on YouTube and start a Patreon page, just be like, hey, if you want to join my lessons, it's $10 a month. Yeah. You know? That is a challenge, and it takes time to build that. And mm-hmm. if you, then it's a numbers game because if you can get a hundred thousand people subscribing to that, then more people subscribe just because sure. there's a hundred thousand people subscribed there's, to it. Yeah, there's that. So uh, I've I've been learning more about it and seeing what's more successful out there. And it's again, it's it's this vibe of you know what? I'm just gonna go try this. I'm not gonna worry about it being so competitive right now. Right. I'm gonna make the content undeniably great. I'm gonna yeah. make it really airtight. It, there's a learning curve to it. Yeah, I'm sure I'm going to look back at these videos in a year and be like, we need to take those down and I need to redo all of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? and, and um, I sandbag myself because I think like, I try, to, I try to appease three years from now, Ryan, with the video. Yeah. And uh, that's not going to happen. And I, no, I, I got to just go. Well, it's funny too. We were talking about my weight loss earlier and like, <laughs> I've dropped 20 pounds since the first videos in March. I'm looking at these. I'm like, oh, man. Yeah, I got to go cut them all again. Yeah, yeah. go do those again because I see my big belly. And then the next video, the belly's gone. People yeah. are, are going to think I'm like starving musician. <laughs> um, or I should be doing weight loss videos yeah. instead of... <laughs> I double dip, man. You can do I guess so. Both. I don't yeah. know. Inspirational weight loss videos. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, but the online teaching, I I feel like... First of all, it's only it's just this is this is the way things are going forward. Mm-hmm. It's gonna it's it's here to stay. It is, and I yeah. and I want to figure out a way to participate in it somehow. Sure, and I may not be super successful at it, and there's gonna be people out there who are gonna, you know, like or certain pages that just end up being like like my music masterclass has been uber successful in jazz, mm-hmm. and that's a big page for us to be competing with on Elite Guitarist, but. Um, it doesn't stop me from going out there and trying it my way a little bit sure. too. And I, and I definitely believe that there's, uh, I mean, there's people that are running these sites that have their team together, yep. and that's and they're full time online teachers. Yep. I can't say I want my career to emulate that. No. I don't want to. Yeah. I don't want to be a full time internet lessons guy. Like nope. there's other things I want to do, and yep. I'm sure you do as well. So yeah. As far mm-hmm. as it's part of my my world within music 
I'm good of it being just a piece of the pie. It doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, well, I mean, there are people that are making a lot of money on online teaching stuff and it's awesome and that's great. And yeah. then, and I like what they're doing for the community of the instrument sure, and music. And sure. My career though, for is going to always be really predominantly playing and sure. recording. So also I believe people like me who play and record for a living part of being successful is you have to maintain a level of mystery and I'm not sure. saying like that you're holding your cards to your chest about what you're doing or trying to be secretive or trying to like connive around what other people are doing but you have you you can't tell everybody everything that's going on because part of performing is hey surprise I have a huge gig next month I'm playing the Hollywood Bowl you sure. know well, or and, and, and the listener hearing an element of surprise in your playing yeah. and and so doing online teaching a little bit of that still helps me maintain a little bit of mystery in my performing career sure. or playing on Jeff's gig. People are like, oh, I wonder what other gigs that guy does. Mm -hmm. Oh, he did Ponder. Oh, he's this is guy in Jeff's band. You know, yeah, like yeah, yeah. all of that is an important thing when, versus people that are just teachers. Right. That's not really an element of that career. In fact, you don't want a lot of mystery. Right. You want people to have as much access to your Agreed. Uh, teaching methods as possible. So it is a little hard to be successful in the online teaching thing when you are going out and, and performing and you're a performing artist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, but, but that's why Larry Kuntz and I are kind of teaming up on this. Larry's a great model for that. There's a guy who has got such an amazing performing career and also has a level of mystery about what he does. He's not sure. as active on social media and he's sure. an older generation guy like that. So, um, as a result, I think putting our heads together, we could be pretty successful with the jazz track on Elite Guitarist. But yeah. we'll see. It's going to be launching in a couple months. I have a lot of more work to do with that. And that's an exciting thing. I'm also hoping that that can piggyback on my record or my record can piggyback on that. So sure. people pay attention to this and they sign up for lessons on there. I think it all works together at yeah. the end of the day. It's the more you put out there, the more it just yep. keeps going. So that's, that's kind of the, the path with all of that right now. And I keep going back to like when you asked about how do you measure success or do you think it's a success? I think that just still being open and willing to the possibilities and then when a poss when an option comes along, taking full advantage of it and yeah. and saying, I can do this. Sure. I can do 40 hours of internet online teaching content and I can record all that this summer. I'm yeah, going to yeah. freaking do that. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to put out a record. I'm going to book those gigs. I'm going to shed these tunes. I'm going to play these tempos. We have to believe in ourselves, and that's where the success comes from, too. Yes, you know? I agree. Because if we're constantly doubting ourselves, or if we pigeonhole ourselves, well, I'm not really that kind of musician. Well, right. I don't really do that kind of stuff. Well, people don't call me for those gigs. Right. Then you start... Or, or uh, I think a big one is, I don't do it as good as them. That's a big one, yep. Then all of a sudden, you find yourself in 10 years being like, man, I never really was able to do the right. career I wanted. Or you get really stuck, you know, and... I can imagine even the uber famous guys, guys like Pat Metheny and stuff, they must at some point feel like, well, I have to be Pat Metheny, you know, yeah. and I got to keep cutting these records. But I mean, talk about someone that was uh, strategic in his career. What is like, he didn't play on anybody's record until I think he had already done five, and then yeah. he started doing those Brecker records. And the ones with Joni and yeah. whatever. Yeah, I know, man, I know. And, and he, he had just set himself up like, I want to go here in my career at a young age. I mean, Bright Size Life was... He was 19, 19 I think. 19 or 20. Yeah. 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 And it's such a different time in the music career then, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Guys like him were totally dependent on a record label to right. promote him. And, and it was successful. It was also a time in society with the counterculture movement, even being a few years into in a, after its infancy, um, after 1968, you know, in the mid-70s, you had a culture of people that were really open to listening to all kinds of music. Yeah. And today, those people are still around, and they're kind of baby boomer generation mm -hmm. people. Um, and on the other hand, you have young people. I have my students. I'm always amazed at what's on their Spotify playlists. They'll go from listening to Joe Pass to listening to Metallica. And I'm okay. just like, that's great. So yeah. that's that. there's still the possibility that someone in that is as creative and as big as someone like that can go become a big star. But... Yeah, but it must be really weird because there comes a point where you don't you don't have a lot of options to try other stuff. And I right. I feel really lucky. I've been able to work and do a lot of different things and um and keep learning, keep growing, keep building on on that. You yeah. know, and and so yeah, it's it's just it's been an, it's been a big time of reflection. And with that with the record coming out, it's going to give me kind of now 
a bit of a, a way to kind of look forward at what would yeah. be what would be the next recording and all all of this other stuff. That's too. killing. Yeah, man. Um, yeah. Let's wrap with this. The gig sure. story. What's sure. the what's, what's my the, worst the, gig yeah. story uh, ever? Not worst, but just something that's. Whatever, a bad gig, you know, maybe the tour got messed up, uh, yeah. something goofy happened on the gig, um, something funny. Just a gig story that you would tell at a house party. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the one that we tell a lot with New West was summer of 2007. I think it was the summer that we were really just out there, and we booked every juke joint from here to Timbuktu, man. Okay. <laughs> that's, a, that's a phrase right we there. We booked did. every juke joint from here to Timbuktu. <laughs> and we found a place in Salt Lake City that would book us. And okay. it was called the Cabana Club. And it was right on the outer rim of, of the Mormon Square where they can serve liquor. Like, you can't okay. serve liquor. On. So um, we go in there, and this place is just horrible. And, and uh, we set up. And there's nobody there. There actually was a father and son who was there to hear us, who was like they were guitar fans. And then there was this drunk guy at the bar. So we get up there and we're playing and we start off with this tune called Blues for Brubeck, which is this really up t- in 3-4 tune. And it's really beboppy. Yeah. And we play and we just freaking play. And there's guys playing pool right here. And it's just really awkward. We get done. And then the two guys who are in front of us, they're kind of clapping. And this guy at the bar turns around. He's like, thank God they stopped. (laughs) And that was after the first tune. And then it was odd because we sat down to take our break. And the whole vibe was so weird. The, The guys that were there, they were like, man, you guys sound great. It's too bad. We couldn't get more people here. And they were nice to us. But the vibe from the from the bar was not good, and the the guy who booked us was nice, and he said, "Yeah, at the end of the night, we pay 150 bucks, and you can order something off the menu." And we're like, "All right." Mm-hmm. And it was eight, it was a four hour gig, Whew. and the cocktail waitress that was kind of in charge after he left was not kind to us, and she's like, "Oh no, you're you're not getting food tonight." Oh yeah, we can't really pay you. There weren't really a lot of people here. Like, it just it went it went from dark to really dark. Yeah. Then we noticed that there was, starting about 10 p.m., there were some older gentlemen that were coming in and sitting down and eating, and the menu was really weird. It was like hamburger, cheese pizza, chicken fingers. Like the, okay. And I was like, okay. And then these young girls were in there that were serving, and they would sit down at the table and talk to these guys for like a little while. And then they'd get up, and then they'd go through this door by the bar, and then about 15 minutes later, the guys would get up and go through that door, mm-hmm. and then 15 minutes later, they'd all they both come back, and this started in for a couple hours, and meanwhile, we all, I think we'd had a lot to drink at that point, because we were just like, we just might as well just get drunk, Yeah, and um, yeah, at the end of the night, packing out, and I'm talking to the bouncer, who was actually kind of chill, and I was like, man, what's up with this place, and he said, oh, well, like, you know, this is where all the, this is. It's like the brothel in town. It's where all the politicians go. You know, <laughs> and I was just like, "What the fuck?" So we played played for a brothel, and uh, yeah, we didn't get paid. <laughs> and we had, fed. and we had a tip jar. We had a a, a big beer pitcher in front that we yeah. put a dollar in, and these jerks that were playing pool all night that were getting more and more drunk came over and then they poured an entire pitcher of beer in. The into pitcher, the tip jar, into yeah. the tip jar that had like five dollars in it, <laughs> oh, man. and we were all in a kind of we were all we, we were driving around in two cars back then, and we got in the car. I remember I get in the car with my buddy, and we just didn't speak to like each other. We weren't pissed at each other, but we were just right trying to so process pissed. everything that had happened. Woke up the next morning. We were staying with our friends in Park City in this beautiful house. We get up and we were just like, did we just do that last yeah, night? And yeah. then we just were in like hysterics. And it, it, it became it became the gig that we like. That's still the. Yeah, that might be the worst. That might that might be the one of the worst ones. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's yeah. There, Played in a brothel in Utah. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Didn't get paid. And the first thing they said to us when we started was, thank God you guys stopped. Right. After after two and one, one song <laughs> on a four hour gig. Never again. <laughs> Yeah, but we all have to do it. You yeah, know? yeah, we yeah. all have to be there. There has to be a few times in our career where you got you got to. I mean, you. I literally felt no, like you got to wonder what am I doing with I my life. I felt like I was going to war. Sure. I felt like I was going into the war room. You yeah, know? John, so. thanks for doing this, man. Oh, my pleasure. Cool, buddy. Uh, thanks, dude. Best of best with the record. And, thanks, dude. Um, yeah. Your website is this johnstory dot com. Yep. Apple Music, Spotify, Apple Music, Spotify, Bandcamp. If okay. people want to donate to the cause and. Um, 
Yeah, and Amazon, it's available everywhere. Yep. Great. And if they want a physical copy, they can come to my show at Sam First on the 29th. Cool. And I'll have all those links up at the awesome. base shed website. Yeah. Thank you, man. Cool. Thanks, buddy. Very, very excited. Uh-huh. Thanks, dude. have enjoyed this episode and would like to know more about upcoming guests and other base shed happenings uh, you can text the word shed s-h-e-d to 66866 uh, i try to make it easy i try to make it easy as possible to stay connected and let's be honest we're uh, we're all sending texts throughout the day so just shoot me one shoot me one that says shed s-h-e-d to 66866 and we'll get you plugged into the newsletter. You can also hear previous versions of the podcast at Apple Podcast, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and Stitcher. Please take a second to rate the show. Um, and if you'd like, you can donate to keep this thing happening. There is a link for that at thebayshed.com backslash podcast. All right, that was John's story. And he is the only guy I know who books every juke joint from here to Timbuktu. Um, <laughs> I thought his gig story was pretty funny. And actually, I was thinking about this the other day. Um, send me send me your gig stories. Like, I want to read through the gig stories from the listeners. And, uh, you know, I'll read the good ones on the mic. I'm, I'm interested in this. I want to hear what your guys' uh, war stories are. Email me at ryan at com. You can check out John's record, Ponderosa. I have links at the website. Um, Bayshed.com backslash podcast backslash John story and there's links there I highly recommend the record um, that's about all I got folks and I'll catch you on the next one